Okay, so this is a problem I've seen uh, show up in a couple places, and I think it's a pretty interesting problem, so I'm going to solve it. Uh, let's just get started. So here, here's how it works. There's a ball on some kind of ramp, and it rolls down the ramp, and then it shoots off the ramp horizontally, and it comes down here and lands on the floor. And so the question is, if the ball starts uh, a distance h1 above the top, this is a table maybe, above the top of the table, and then the table is a height of h2 above the floor, then how far does it land from the edge of the table to the point where it lands? Um, okay, so now a couple of assumptions. Uh, one is a horizontal launch. I'm assuming a horizontal launch. And so what does that mean? I should write it down. That means that at this point, it's shot directly this way. Okay, so that is important. Uh, number two, uh, no ball, no rolling. I'm assuming that the ball slides down here, and I think that's the way most of the problems want to solve. I will make another video in which I assume the ball is rolling and not sliding, because it is rolling. Okay, but so we're gonna assume it, it's just rolling. If you wanna pick a mass, we have the mass M. Uh, we have the gravitational field, uh, G equals zero, negative 9.8, zero newtons per kilogram. Uh, but I think the important thing is to think about this into, in two parts. So part one would be rolling down the ramp, rolling, down the ramp, and then two, projectile motion. And we're gonna have to use uh, these two problems in the very different ways to solve. Uh, but the thing is that if I say this starts with a velocity, I'll call this V0 equals zero, and then down here we'll call this V1 as the velocity that way, and then we'll have some velocity down here which I don't really care about. But the velocity at the end of the ramp is the velocity at the beginning of the projectile motion. So let's use the velocity at the end of the ramp and let's just take that problem first. So if I have, let's just redraw the ramp, and I have it curved, here's my ball, uh, and it's gonna be rolling down this way. Well, what force is acting on the ball? I have the gravitational force, mg, pulling down, and the normal force pushing that way. And so as this thing rolls along, then it's difficult to use Newton's second law. I can't do this, F net equals MA, and then use that to find the velocity at the end. I can't do that because I don't know this normal force. There's two things that change. The direction of the normal force changes because the curve, the track's curved, and the magnitude changes because now it's moving in a circular path. The, acceleration will be this way. So it's a really complicated problem to use forces. So I'm not gonna do that. But I can use work energy. So if I use work energy and pick the system, in this case, I'm gonna pick the system of the ball plus the earth, then I can say work is a change in energy and what forces are gonna do work on my system. Well, I don't have work done by gravity because it's part of my system. The ball and the earth are in my system. So I'll have a two types of energy. I'll have kinetic energy, one half mv squared, and gravitational potential energy, mgy. And I have this because the earth is part of my system. Well, that leaves the track. Does the track do work on the system? And the answer is no, because no matter which way the ball is moving, I define work, as F dot delta R or F delta R cosine theta. No matter what point it, the ball is in this situation, the angle between delta R, the way it's moving, and the normal force is 90 degrees. So this is gonna be F, well, N, let's write it as, it's gonna be N delta R cosine pi over two equals zero. So it's always going to be zero. So the, the normal force does no work on the system. Okay, so that means that we have uh, not too difficult of a problem. We have no work done on the system. We have a change in kinetic plus change in potential. So let's go up here and let's say, right, that work is the change in kinetic plus the change in potential, and that's zero. So again, let me draw my picture. Let's call this 
uh, position zero and this position one. So that's V1, that's V0. And let's call this Y1, Y0. And I'm gonna put Y equals zero as the, um, as the table. You, you actually can do whatever you want. No, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna put this, the ground, as Y equals zero. So they're not, neither is zero, because I want to. Okay, so I have work is zero. Zero is the change in kinetic, which is gonna be K1 minus K0, plus U1 minus U0. And I'm using one and zero because I'm gonna have a two down here, and I just don't wanna have, I just wanna have to reuse numbers. So one of these uh, values is actually going to be zero, and that's gonna be this. If I release the ball from rest, then the initial kinetic energy is gonna be zero. So now I have zero equals one half m v one squared, that's the kinetic energy at the end, plus the potential at point one is gonna be m g, and that's the magnitude of the gravitational field, y one minus m g y zero. And I want to solve for V1. So uh, let's just subtract these terms from both sides. I get 1 half M V1 squared is going to be negative M G Y1 plus M G Y0. Uh, I can divide both sides by M and multiply by 2. And I get V1 squared equals, I'm going to switch this to order, 2 G y0 minus y1. Is that okay? I fact, the mass canceled and I factored that out. Now, let's say this is h1, so y0, so y1 is h, no I'm sorry, I called that h2, is h2, y0 is gonna be h2 plus h1, right? Because this is h1. So that whole height is h1 plus h2. So that means y0 minus y1 is gonna be h2 plus h1 minus h2 is just h1. So now I get uh, v1 equals the square root of two g h1. That's how fast it's moving down here at the bottom. Now I can use that velocity and move on to the next part of the problem, which is to find out where it lands. And so we can't use work energy in that case because uh, there's no forces acting in the, in the horizontal direction after it leaves the, ball, the ramp, and so you can't really use anything to find that distance. So we'll just use a normal projectile motion problem. So now we go over here. I don't even care about the ramp. I have this height, h2. This is v1 and it goes like this. So once the ball leaves the track and I draw the force diagram for it, it looks like this. The only force acting on it is the gravitational force. That means F net in the X direction is zero equals M A X. F net in the Y direction is gonna be negative M G equals M A Y. So AX equals zero, AY is negative G. Now, one of the important things about projectile motion is that I have uh, the motion in the X direction is independent of the motion in the Y direction, except for time. So let's write down everything we know about the X direction. So I've already picked this as my Y axis. I'm gonna pick that as my origin. So that's uh, X motion, let's write this down. So I know the initial x position, I'll call this x1 equals zero. x2 is over here, is equal to, I don't know. That's what I'm trying to find. V1 x, what's the velocity in the x direction? Well, it's, it's moving in the x direction, right? So it's just gonna be V1, which we just found, which was the square root of two g h1. Uh, what else do I know? Well, I can find x2. I know the, since the acceleration is zero, x2 equals x1 plus v1x times t. We're assuming this is t equals zero up here. So delta t is just the final t at the end. 
And this is just the kinematic equation for constant velocity. So if I knew the time, I know the initial velocity, I know the initial position, I could find the final position. And that is my value for s. But I don't know time. So let's go to the y motion. What do we know about the y motion? So I know the initial position, I'll call that y1 equals h2. That's where it starts. I also know y2 is zero. It ends up down here at the ground. I know one thing else. I know v y one y is zero. The initial y velocity of the ball in the y direction is zero because it's shot horizontally. So this is zero. Uh, and then I know a y is negative g. So I can put that together with the kinematic equation and I get y two equals y1 plus vy, 1y, I'm calling it 1y, t minus 1 half g t squared. So it's plus 1 half a, but I have a as negative g. So here I know everything in this equation except t because that's 0 uh, and that's 0. So I get 0 equals y1, which is h2, minus 1 half g t squared. And I want to solve for t. So let's add this to both sides. 1 half g t squared equals h2. Multiply both sides by 2 and divide by g. t squared equals 2 h2 over g. And then take the square root. t is equal to the square root of 2 h2 over g. Now I can take this and put it in for t over there. And I'm running out of space, so I'll do it on this. It's OK to waste. You're not wasting paper if you're actually doing work. So I have x2 equals x1 plus v1xt. So that's going to be that's 0. So I have v1, which I said was 2gh1, square root 2gh1. t is this square root of 2 h2 over g. So I can write this as x2 equals s. That's what I'm looking for. And let's put that all in the square root. So I get 2 g h1 2 h2 over g. The g's cancel. Uh, I can pull the 2 times 2 is 4, I can pull that out front, and I get 2 square root of h1 h2 equals s. That's how far it goes. Okay, so let's just kind of make sense of this and make sure that things are going okay. So what if, let me draw my picture. Oops, I draw it again. Okay, so we call this h1 and this h2. So first, does it have the right units? Uh, well, so 2 has no units in this case because it came from that 2 factors of 1 half. Um, h1 is in meters. This is in meters. So I get meters squared. I take the square root, and I get meters. So it does have the right units. Okay, what about as h1 goes to 0? If h1 is 0, then it starts down here, and it's not going to have a velocity. So it's not even going to fall off. So, I mean, if you want to consider it falling off, it just falls straight down. So if h1 is 0, and I put in h1 0 here, I get, I get 0. That makes sense. Also, if h2 is 0. If h2 is 0, then uh, this is flat. And so how far does it go? It, it just hits the ground, so it goes to 0, too. Um, what about as h1 gets bigger? If I increase the value of h1, then it should start higher up, and it should go further. And so that's what this says, too, right? If I increase h1, s does get bigger. Also, if I increase h2, it should get bigger. So the, the, the answer seems to make sense. I don't see anything wrong with the answer, which doesn't mean it's right, but I don't see anything that's wrong, but it, it is right. So, because I did this right. Okay, so I, I will make another video where I um, include the rotational motion of the ball, uh, but that'll be another video, so just hold on for that, and I'll see you later.